sports are really important vehicles for relationships. We have purpose. We have a why. We bring people together. We connect. I feel like God is our greatest supporter and our greatest coach. Hosts of the new podcast, The Franchise, Jew Sports in America. Judaism's encounter with sports and this country of the United States. Meredith has appeared on MSNBC, Fox, C-SPAN, NPR, ESPN Radio, PBS NewsHour, ESPN2, and more. We are honored that Meredith Shiner is joining with us on Rabbi on the Sidelines. Thank you. First of all, let's talk about your entry. In, you, you've done everything, politics yeah. and sports, and now this podcast of Jew Sports and America. Let's first talk about your journal, uh, your journalism into sports, as we were just talking about a graduate of Duke University, Coach K, one of the best college basketball coaches. How did you get into the sports world? I went to Duke. I was really interested in sports journalism. I was really in, into political journalism, and I was sort of stuck between the two and what I wanted to do. And I felt like being at Duke, there was such a strong opportunity to cover sports journalism at the highest level um, and to really learn in that sort of um, almost like laboratory of a newsroom. That's what student newspapers are to me. To me, like student newspapers are among the most important vehicles for journalism and journalism training because you have a group of really committed people who just want to cover the communities that they're in. Uh, and for Duke, like the, the sports community and the sports angle and aspect is really important. And so that was how I got my start in sports journalism. And it's honestly how I ended up being connected to this podcast, uh, because a few of my former colleagues uh, at the Duke Chronicle, which is the student newspaper at Duke, um, were connected to Tablet in some way. And when they were looking for a host for a potential podcast on Jews and sports, my name was floated because I think a lot of times the conversation in sports can be really male dominated. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about a podcast and creating a new podcast, trying to think about a different voice um, or someone who could take a unique angle, part of that is actually just representative and who's doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And so having a woman host the show is very different because there are a lot of media figures in sports that you could choose who are Jewish, but who are also men. Uh, and so the way that I interpreted the assignment, I think, about what a show about Jews in sports could be was different than someone who might be sort of in the day-to-day -day grind of being a sports reporter. So you talked about how the person doing it has the perspective of putting a little different angle on it. I'm yes. a rabbi. I'm in the religion business, but I'm sort of now dabbling in your world of the sports world. So take us through your Jewish journey, and then we're going to connect those. Oh, my Jewish journey. Okay. Uh, I think one of the like really stressful things about now becoming a Z-list like Jewish podcast celebrity is that I don't really purport to be representative of all Jews. And I respect and appreciate that you asked me about my specific journey because I do think it's a bit unique. And that's what's so beautiful about Judaism, right? It's the way that people conceive about Judaism. I think it's this blend of religiosity and culture um, that makes it a really like special kind of community. Um, and it's really hard to explain. And so part of the show is actually trying to show and not tell what that means to me because like I'm present in the show. It's really hard to do a show, an eight episode scripted podcast without the host and the writer being present in some way. And one of the things that I'm really honest about uh, is that I have a toddler, he's two, uh, and I am raising him Jewish, um, but I'm in an interfaith marriage. And one of the things I've been thinking about lately, uh, just because of thinking about how I want to raise him, but also this show, is that when I was growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, I belonged to a conservative Jewish synagogue. It was the one that was in our community. I went to Hebrew school, you know, seven hours a week. Uh, I was bat mitzvahed, you know, the whole shebang, right? But something that really stuck out to me and something that I remember very vividly at the time, like being like a young kid in the 90s, was that often in high holiday sermons, there was a conversation about what interfaith marriage meant to American Jews and that it was this dynamic that was shunned. And I was too young to really understand what that mean or me meant or to have a perspective on it. But as I got older, I really thought about what Judaism meant to me and what how I conceive of Judaism. And for me, like the most important parts of Judaism are this idea of righteousness and justice, but also 
choice and choosing what your community is and choosing your faith and your practice. And so this all connects to the podcast because, well, in a very, one, in a very literal way, uh, the most important thing to my husband is the Atlanta Braves, mm-hmm. um, which I know is probably a hard thing to talk about with an LA crowd. Um, I won't mention but, Freddie Freeman right now, but just saying. I know. Well, and that was, that was like a whole, I don't even want to get into that whole chaos <laughs> and mess. Uh, it could, it could take up the whole rest of the podcast. And I, I already lost say, like. We had, the- we had Jeff Passon on, on uh, Purim and he said, that was Purim. That was March. That was spring training. And he said that we will see the LA Dodgers in the World Series. So right now we're on track to uh, having the prophecies of the rabbi on sidelines come true. I mean, I don't know if that's like some sort of like Messiah position when like they spend more money than any other team in baseball. But, you know, if you want to make a guess and have it prove to be right, guessing that the Dodgers could be in the World Series is a pretty safe yeah. one. Um, but this is all a digression that we were sitting at this table at this bar in D.C., Um, Because we didn't even talk about what I actually did as a full professional journalist, which was cover Mm -hmm. Congress and politics um, for almost a decade in Washington. But we made a trade. I traded the Atlanta Braves for Judaism. I was like, you know, I know that the Braves are important to you and Judaism is important to me. So I will raise we'll raise a Jewish Braves fan if and when we decide to get married and have kids. And so when I think about what this podcast is like at a very personal level, like I try to make it inclusive and for everyone, even if they're not super interested in sports or even if they're not super interested in Jews, it's an exploration that I hope is accessible. But I also sort of feel like at the end of it, it's kind of this love letter to this two-year-old who may or may not one day listen to it, like a a relic in a box that he could stumble into one day and understand like why he inherited all these sports passions, why we exposed him to Judaism and tried to to make that choice for him that one day he could choose isn't meaningful to him. Um, But for him to sort of see what it means to be Jewish and American and love sports in this way that is dynamic and really driven by stories that reflect the multitude of us, whether it's how people have engaged with sports professionally or casually, or even how they view their relationship to Judaism and sports. For a lot of people I've talked to, it's really fl- familial, right? It's, you know, my parents were Mets fans and my grandparents were Mets fans because they were either shunned by the Giants or the Dodgers. And this is like, this is what I've inherited. But for some people, you know, I know you've talked to Tamir Goodman, yes. like his religiosity is so central to his athleticism. And that was so unique to me because that's different than than my conception or my view or my space and life with Judaism. And so I've loved being able to listen to people talk Mm -hmm. about those answers and figure out how they fit together in this much larger story. And I think what Tamir is doing so beautifully now is first he formed his own identity at Maryland, at Towson now and, you know, in in Israel, what he's doing. But now I don't call it interfaith. I call it multi-faith. Mm -hmm. Meaning each faith can be as strong as the other, but this ball is actually bringing people together. So you mentioned an interesting theme about bringing Jews, sports, and America together. And I want to play this little clip that uh, when I began this podcast about a year and a half ago, I asked Rabbi Wolpe, Rabbi David Wolpe, my senior rabbi here at Sinai Temple, like, should a rabbi be involved in these conversations about sports? And this is what he said, and we'll talk about that. That the, The idea that you actually can't be a rabbi without understanding American culture and that American culture is not just literature. It's what people do. I would say, like, you could say baseball, but you could also, you know, I mean, you could say NASCAR, you could say the Super Bowl, you could say like the whole range of where people have their passions and and their loyalties and so on. I actually really think that it's an important part of people's, I know this may sound strange, their spiritual life is sometimes tied up with the teams that they love and also with the teams that they hate. The spiritual life is tied to the teams that we love and we hate. Maybe you can comment on some of that as being a sports journalist, as being a Jew, and being an American. Oh, that I mean, that's really deep. So I don't know that I can add anything that feels more profound than that. But there are so many elements to being a sports fandom. Like I had touched previously on this idea of inheritance, right? This connection that we have to our families and our communities. And for Jews historically, I think that that's really important. So, you know, this podcast launched this week uh, on October 12th. So yesterday at the time that we're speaking live. And 
I started it with Sandy Koufax, not just because I figured that I might be streaming with a synagogue in Los Angeles, but because 1965 is so important yes. as a year, right? Like I even say explicitly in this episode, this isn't Hank Greenberg erasure, but there's something about his timing in addition to his greatness that's so important because the 60s were such a time of transformation for America and a reckoning and a grappling with, I think, what the best it was that we could be, right? Like the, the core of the civil rights movement to me was reaching for a promise and an aspiration. And mm -hmm. so I start with Sandy because being able to see him in that space, being able to see him sit on Yom Kippur, it was a really important cultural and political moment, right? Mm -hmm. Even if he wasn't going to say anything that was overtly political, even if he wasn't going to go to synagogue that day, in that moment, in that space, in that decade, it was hugely consequential because we were still trying to figure out who we were going to be and what our place in America would be. And so when we connected to sports teams in our own cities, oftentimes as immigrants to this country or yep. to those cities, it was a way for us to assimilate into the cultures in which we live. The bigger questions, which are more rabbinical questions about faith and are sports just, which is something I'm trying to explore in the conclusion of, of my series. So define like, what do you mean by is sports just? Oh, well, so one of the reasons why I love this question is because I think it's actually a Rorschach test for how people interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can, you can actually mean it in a micro sense or a macro sense. Like in a mm -hmm. micro sense, when you're a fan of a team, like you might feel like your team winning is right. And that would be the just outcome for you. You know, you've spent all of your years investing mm -hmm. in this team and you get to this place and you feel like the just outcome would be your team winning. Mm -hmm. But it but it doesn't work the work that way. And that kind of stinks. And where does, God, are, where does God fit in that just piece? Because you did a beautiful you, survey. You tell me you're the rabbi. Well, I'm, so just, I'm uh, just a person with a podcast. <laughs> then let's play this real clip. This is okay. Dave Sins, who are talking about playoff baseball. He's one of the only African American play by play TV analysts for the Seattle Mariners. And this is what he said about God and uh, maybe the justice of how the players go on the field. It's the sixties, you hardly saw it. And I think the mm -hmm. 70s and 80s, we probably have seen more demonstrations of that kind of stuff. And guys hit a home run and they're doing all this. It's like, yeah, when you're going, when you're 0 for your last 17, what are you doing? I think that's it. When, you're 0, when you're 0 for 17, is there justice on the field? I mean, I don't know. I mean, right. it's a, isn't that also like what we're supposed to do as Jews is like live in that discomfort? But yes. so I didn't even get to this macro piece, right? Which is a piece that really interests me. I like to joke that one of like my fun party tricks when I used to like go out and ha <laughs> didn't have a toddler and there wasn't a pandemic and that wasn't even that often then was that I could ruin sports for people like in one conversation because to me and the way that I think about it, yes, like sports can be fun and you have a team that you root for, but they're also multi-billion dollar businesses. Yes. Like if you ask me one of the, what one of the great civil rights fights of our time is it's, fighting against the like false notion of amateurism in college athletics, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have a multi-billion dollar industry that's built on the backs of unpaid labor and they're often athletes of color. And the people who profit off that and why and what they get in exchange, like to me, that's really complicated. And like this connects to the show in the sense that one, it comes from my brain, but two, I think that sports can be a really effective lens to explore any sort of issue, whether it's civil rights or the place of Jews in America. And when I think about justice, like one of the ideas that I'm kicking around, uh, and if anyone listening has a direct connect to Sue Bird, like, please let me know. We'll talk after. Is, <laughs> yeah. Is this idea that, um, you know, uh, sort of like waiting for Elijah, right? I feel like American Jews are waiting for the next Sandy. But what if she was already here and the reason she's not considered that is for the same issues that she's advocating off the court, mm -hmm. right? Like we yeah. have a Jewish athlete who's probably like among the greatest who ever played, if not the greatest, right? I don't want to like spew a hot take. We'll just say among the greatest. And she's also someone who has lived by her ideals, who's mm -hmm. 
openness in her life has changed people's lives. And it doesn't matter if it's being open on social media about her marriage or being one of the most powerful first players to put a vote Warnock shirt on to help force the sale of a WNBA team and contribute to the loss of a sitting United States Senator. Like that is real power. That is real conviction. And that's talent. And why we don't see her that way is a reflection of some of the injustices that she's fighting. Um, and like, that's, that's fascinating to me, but that's also not, you know, that's not like a fun conversation, mm -hmm. but that's a, a conversation that asks us to evaluate ourselves and to think about how we conceive of greatness. And is that gendered? Is it biased? Is it racist? Like all of those questions sort of come into play. And I'm trying to make sure that I touch at least a little bit on all of them, because if you're trying to cover like the intersections of Jews, sports in America in yeah. eight episodes, you're not going to go deep into every single thing. But I really at least want to acknowledge some of these things to make sure that these dynamics or people who identify or don't identify as Jewish see themselves in the series. Well, I'm about 75 episodes in, and I think I'm only even close to touching the surface. So I'm looking uh, excited to uh, see what happens after eight. When you talked about really sports actually looking into ourselves and identifying who we are, this is what Ernie Johnson said when he came on the show. And this was right after his son passed away just a couple of months. It was during the NBA All-Star break. And I asked him how he took his journey of faith. And at first he explained that he'd reached the mountaintops, but then he referred to Psalm 23, it talks about there's mountaintops and valleys, and this is what Ernie Johnson said. Uh, eras where um, in 1997 or so, I'm just like, is this it? You know, is this is this why I'm here? Is this my purpose? I'm, mm -hmm. You know, is this where the joy in my life is going to come from, is from doing this work? And, and, and um, so we decided to kind of explore... Ernie Johnson saying, like, why am I here? What is this work? As you mentioned before the show, you love Inside the NBA. Everybody loves Inside the NBA. But he is, a, I would say, a human being of soul, a human being of purpose, a human being who in the right moments brings in the right topics to allow us as an American audience to think as well. So how do you take this world of sports and allow the listener, the 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 participant and the audience member to ask those questions and not just look at a box score and a trade deadline? So that's a really great question. And there's so much about it that I want to respond to, because I think the piece of it that resonates the most with me, the piece of that clip that you showed was just this idea of grief mm -hmm. and where to put it and how to incorporate it into our daily routine. And for some people that routine includes God. And for some people that routine doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. And that's okay, by the way. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give an anecdote from the show and then I'm going to take the question a little bit more personally and give an anecdote from my life. Um, so next week's episode is about Tamir Goodman. Oh, nice. um, but the thing that I like to say about the episodes of the show is they're not actually about the, actors in them they're not about like just like the first episode wasn't about sandy the second episode isn't necessarily about tamir it's about the assumptions that we made mm -hmm. about him the things that we projected onto him mm -hmm. when he was a teenager and evaluating whether that was fair or whether we got it right like a where are they now story is so reductive but actually asking ourselves why we did the things that we did and whether we understood things properly with the context of time and figuring out where we are in that journey is so important. And Tamir was so interesting. He, I've interviewed a lot of people, right? I've interviewed Coach K, as you mentioned. I've interviewed many United States senators and members of Congress. Like I've legitimately like stood in the Oval Office uh, as a representative of the member, like of the free press corps. Um, but Tamir was one of the most fascinating people I've ever interviewed because he was very generous with what he shared and how he talked. And his faith was so mm -hmm. fascinating to me because it was the thing that gave him 
the moral architecture, architecture and the real architecture of his life in a way that felt genuine and authentic and that I admired. Uh, and he talked a lot. I don't want to spoil the like <laughs> pinnacle of the episode, but he talked about his dad. And yeah. I think so much of these stories do come to that sort of connection and those personal connections and those human connections. And sometimes that like in the case of Ernie Johnson, you know, he's been very transparent and forthcoming that that a lot of those things are really direct, like directly connected to God and his faith. But, you know, when I think about Judaism for me, and this is where the personal anecdote is going to come in, um, it was always so important for me to be present in the community that I invested in and that I built for myself. And sometimes when you're in a really difficult place, you see the dividends of that investment. Mm -hmm. And to me, a lot of the values I learned from Judaism were ones that I had applied to my life and that ultimately I ended up being very grateful for. Um, in 2019, I lost a pregnancy at uh, 23 weeks. And um, that's a that's a challenging thing. It's also a, a state of fact about me. Um, it I've it's made me think about my conception of grief and relationships. Uh, but also, obviously, I've been highly political on the issue too, um, because the doctors who are the most important people in my life, uh, bit characters in my life, uh, are the same ones that people across the country are trying to imprison. So I'm not going to sidetrack this conversation there. But one of the things that I remember so vividly was just being in that moment and feeling a moment of loss, but also creating space for community and knowing that because, you know, my husband and I had spent so many years investing into people in our lives, that they were able to be present for us. And my interpretation of Judaism is basically this idea of family and community, because that that's sort of reflective of my worldview and it's present in the show. And it's not a singular interpretation of Judaism. It is sort of um, inherent to me. But when you play that clip from Ernie after he lost his son, you know, that purpose question, there are so many ways to get to that answer. And we spend so much of our life thinking about how to arrive there. And there are moments in our life that it feels more intense than others, mm -hmm. right? Like, dedicating the time to think or question our purpose can sometimes feel like a luxury when we're in the day to day grind of our lives. Um, but I think more than ever before, like in this moment, in these past few years, I thought a lot about my purpose and identity because I now have someone in my life who will see that at some point, who will become aware of that, who will absorb that. And part of him being proud of me is also me being proud of me. And that's tied to an identity and purpose in a way that I think is really intense and significant. No, I, I think we are often looking, I, I love what you just said. We are often looking for somebody to be proud of us, to basically allow or permit us to also be proud of us um, because it's hard to just be proud of us and go say, yay me. But when you have that other person, that other community, and actually I think that's a really deep ideal of what sports does. It, what it does for me, um, you shared a obviously very personal story of your own grief and for my own personal story and the way I connected with Ernie I actually lost a brother in 2017 at 36 years old a quadriplegic and throughout his whole life as a quadriplegic it was the sports community that it was about wins and losses we cried about lots of losses at Syracuse University believe me there were lots of wins in final fours as witnessed by Carmelo Anthony behind me and coach Beheim. but the community that was created through the sports world again is there God in that world maybe or maybe not but there was a sense of sacredness that what were people were doing was for not just for themselves, but for others. And mm -hmm. This is also just one other clip that Rabbi Wolpe shared about how sports and we said Shabbat services, I asked him, have commonalities that we've talked about building community and also generations as well. There are two things that tie sports and, and, and services together that I think are really wonderful. One is they're two of the very rare places where different generations sit next to one another and root for the same thing. And second is they're two of the few collective experiences, cheering with other people or singing with other people. Those are both really powerful. Um, of course, the aim of both of them is different. And also to be a fan is what you are at the football game. If services, you're also the player. You're also the participant. 
So there's so many different parallels. And when, again, I, I was the first kid to run out of services and didn't drive on Shabbat, would walk the two miles to the carrier dome to make sure I had that ticket in hand. But I was also learning the values within the synagogue as well. Um, when you put these worlds together, and let's go back to Kofax, because I want to go to Jock Peterson, a more modern uh, hero of yeah. our day for the LA Dodgers. You detail at the end of this first episode this difference between Jock Peterson and Sandy Koufax and relate that to Jews and sports in America. What are the difference between them today? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, look, Sandy's awesome. He's still awesome. Like when, when the Dodgers finally held the ceremony, like many years too late, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to unveil the statue at Dodger stadium of Sandy Koufax, where it's him and it's Jackie Robinson, which I mean, name and a, a more iconic duo right mm -hmm. uh he's so cool like he's <laughs> cool but the thing about sandy is that he had to be perfect right at that time there was so much pressure for him because he was known as jewish at the time that he did it like he he emerged singularly because he was the best he wasn't afraid to sit on Yom Kippur. And so he embodied sort of all of these hopes of what we could be in an America that was not yet fully realized. Right. And, you know, obviously I have some strong political opinions on that America still is not fully realized. But when we think about where Jews are in America today, mm -hmm. relative to 1965, even though there are a lot, there's a lot of perilous territory in terms of where anti-Semitism is and how it's on the rise and how it's 100%. being amplified. And I'm not trying to diminish that. I do think there's also still like more assimilation today than there had been in the sixties of us into the culture. And so someone like Jock Peterson can just be irreverent and he can be the icon of a postseason for like wearing pearls and drinking red wine and uttering profanity. And that's also cool. And there's just like less pressure for it to be. And the, the, the word we use in the episode is just this idea of a model minority, right? I think that that's been such an albatross for so many marginalized communities. Uh, How would you define model minority? So like this idea, and I think this was ascribed traditionally to Jews. And sometimes now there's a conversation culturally about how it's, applied to Asian Americans. It's this idea that, you know, like you are Jewish and you're going to work the hardest in school and you're graduate top of your class and you're going to the Ivy League. Like in a lot of ways, like Sandy being the best and being among the first players to get a signing bonus in all of Major League Baseball and being a Hall of Fame pitcher and winning World Series and being handsome while doing it. Like there was all of that that he embodied and I think in a lot of ways, he embodied that because of what where Jews wanted to see themselves in society because they hadn't yet gotten there. And there was so much pressure for them to outwork everyone else to get what they felt like they earned in American society. And some of that residual sort of psychology still exists today for American Jews. But I think the intensity of it is much different than what it looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 years I, ago. I'm going to throw in an interesting piece, maybe in okay. the Israel piece, because now here, Tamar, Tamir was in Baltimore. And uh, it's interesting, Tamir and I are the same age. So in 1999, when he was, or 2000, when he was graduating high school, I went to a secular private school and I showed my coach the paper. And I said, This is why I can't play on Friday night either. And he said, Well, who's yeah. this and what's this about? And it was an amazing learning experience because my teammate was actually an African American Seventh day Adventist who also wouldn't play on Friday night. So it was two out of 10. So we were actually in really good shape. Um, but then he goes to Israel. And now it's interesting when you talk about anti Semitism, we have sort of that Israel piece. So, like when Omri Kospi hops over here, or now these Israeli players, or for instance, Israeli baseball, when most of them actually are American players, mm -hmm. do you see any connection of? Israel sort of weaving into this franchise idea of Jewish sports America. Is there an and Israel piece in there as well? So there is not an and Israel piece. Um, and I think one, it's for a few reasons. Like when you have only eight episodes to slot in, being able to choose sort of the parameters of what you're trying to accomplish is really important. Like if we were doing a show about global Jews and sports, that's mm -hmm. a much 
that's a much bigger assignment, right? Like you are going to be covering more of the Olympics and like there, there are all these things that sort of factor into right. it. Um, and this is not to discount the ways American Jews might feel Israel plays a role in their life or their political views, for example. It just, other than the fact that I interviewed Tamir and he was in Jerusalem and we had a tape roller in Jerusalem and he talked oh, about yeah. how Jerusalem has been important to him and some mm -hmm. of his relationships, like that's in the show. But beyond that, it's, it's not. And that was just sort of like an editorial choice and trying to figure out what the show could look like. Do you think that if he was living here today and made his life in Baltimore or New York or LA, he would be able to do what he's doing now here? Or do you think that that location maybe helped him doing what he's doing in terms of bringing people together? I, I mean, I don't want to put words in his mouth in this particular <laughs> perspective. Like, yeah. I think that, you know, Israel is really important to him and it's home for him now. But, you know, one of the things that was really moving about our conversation was he talked a lot about his wife and how yeah. important she was. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think that people need to be rooted to one geography to be able to express their true and best selves. Maybe they do, but I, I, you know, I think that he would be doing good wherever he is mm -hmm. uh, and maybe would look a little different, but I think that he'd, he'd still be the same person just in a different context. And so when we look at the baseball world right now, in terms of all these Jews, then Bregman and Freed and Peterson, do they see themselves as a Sandy Koufax? Are we looking at them as a Sandy Koufax or are they Freed and Peterson and Bregman? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, I'm married to a Braves fan. So it means I watch a lot of Atlanta Braves football, which yeah. or baseball, sorry, which is fine by me because like the White Sox are really frustrating and that's my team. And But a great announcer, coach. Jason Benetti is a good friend. I love Jason. That's an amazing um, story right there. A wonder, like a wonderful person, yep. incredibly generous, uh, was willing to like write a card for my cousin, like wishing him Mazel Tov on his bar mitzvah. Uh, amazing. So like, Good egg, Jason Benetti. If there's like one takeaway from the show, I'm like happy to be on the record saying that. Um, oh, so Braves baseball, I watch a lot of it. Oftentimes, like they will put a side by side of Max Fried and Sandy Koufax because mm -hmm. they're lefties, they're from LA, they're Jewish. And when they're side by side in those graphics, some of their mechanics look very similar. Like this was an interesting piece of reporting Sandy uh, and his story and his place in baseball and the role that he's played for players like Clayton Kershaw, mm -hmm. like the entire science of baseball was so different in the 1960s and that it didn't exist. And when, right. when coaching and pitching coaching got more sophisticated, like at 20 second time out, I just watched the <laughs> Nolan Ryan documentary on Netflix and it was so fun, but Nolan Ryan didn't get a pitching coach until his second major league baseball team. Mm -hmm. like didn't get a pitching coach. And so the thing that's so fascinating about Sandy, like from a pure baseball perspective is that his mechanics were so unique and so perfect that they, after, um, you know, he was well after he was done playing, they broke down his mechanics and they were showing it to other people. So the idea that you would have a Max Freed and their, you know, release would look similar is actually maybe not even accidental in terms of like how we're trying to train pitchers to be pitchers. So you see those side by side comparisons, but this is another big question of the show. Um, you know, I think about it like Jewish geography, right? Like we love playing it and we love being able to identify athletes as Jewish. Yes. But that's a really weird dynamic, right? Like I, I and it, I don't, I feel kind of uncomfortable with it because I think identifying as Jewish, like what is built into the idea of identification is that you self-identify. Like mm -hmm. you say that you are Jewish and I respect that you say that you are regardless of, you know, like how you got to Judaism, for example, like I don't feel comfortable claiming people as Jewish who don't want to be claimed. And yeah. it's interesting sometimes how that works out. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I think about Ryan Braun and how excited people were to say that he was Jewish, but he didn't want to identify as Jewish. And then he got caught cheating. And then we're like, actually, no, he said he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, he was trying to contest his positive drug test result and said the test taker was anti-Semitic. So, like, it can get kind of tricky. A little ugly, yep. Yeah, so, you know, part of someone being Sandy is that they want to be really identified that way. And, you know, you had mentioned in the questions that you sent over, um, part of the first episode, I talked to a great Atlanta-based reporter, Jeff Schultz, 
And in preparing for our interview, he knew that I wanted to talk about this one day in 2019 where there was a there were a few divisional series games on Yom Kippur. Mm-hmm. And um, the Braves were scheduled to play a twilight game. And Max Fried was not the starter, but he was there because it was the decisive game. He was there in case he needed to be called in in later innings that would have been after sundown. And so he asked Max about it. And Max had actually, because Mike fulton uh, again, another benefit of having lived with a Braves fan is that a, that's a thing that I can say on first take, which is really nice. Uh, Mike fulton implodes Easier in the first inning. Hmm? Easier than Smoltz. Oh, I guess. Uh, and so Max Free gets called in because otherwise they're going to be hemorrhaging runs and they they like decide the Braves decide that this is what they want to do. And obviously he volunteered to be in the bullpen. Um, but when Jeff talked to him, Max admits, and he had never told anyone this, that he had been fasting that day. That's amazing. And so we report that and we confirmed that. But the other thing about it was, is like, I didn't want to like put in like huge headlines, Max Fried actually fasted on Yom Kippur because he obviously didn't want people to know at the time or mm-hmm. like didn't talk about it. And like, I don't want to like make a huge deal of things that people don't want to make a huge deal about. And so mm-hmm. part of the exploration of the episode too is, in the year of our Lord 2022, what do we want athletes to do and what do they need to do to express right. whatever it is their sense of justice or righteousness is? Like mm-hmm. maybe it's sitting on Yom Kippur, but maybe it's something else. You mm-hmm. know, maybe it is putting on that Boat Warnock shirt. Maybe it is being G- Gabe Kapler saying, you know, until something actually gets done on guns, I'm not going to stand for the national an- anthem. You know, um, you were talking about a tablet author's book on the tree of life synagogue shooting. Yep. And, you know, Julian, yep. Julian Edelman put mm-hmm. the tree of life symbols on his shoes when he played that week. So actually the are- university of Pittsburgh basketball team, cause they were playing Syracuse during those couple of weeks. And I'm turned on ESPN and right around the collar, they had a Magain David, the star of David on each of their jerseys. And I wrote to Tim O'Toole, the assistant coach who actually was an assistant coach for coach K and for coach Bayheim. And I said, you have no idea who I am, but, I'm thousands of miles away, and that touched me completely. And they said, this is who we stand for. This is who our neighbors are. And it was one of those moments. Yeah. There was not one Jew on the team coaching or players. But they said, no, this is something in this country of America that means more than the game that we're going to play. Yeah. And so, you know, we shouldn't be so narrow in our conception of what demonstrating those values can look like. And so it's a convoluted way of saying it's hard to answer your question of like, you know, who is Sandy? Are they Sandy? And mm-hmm. like, what does it mean to be Jewish and a baseball player and how you talk about it is sort of within their power. And so exploring those ideas of like, how do we identify people because we want to be proud of Jewish athletes, but also like a lot of it is within their rights to say how they would like to identify. And it's just sort of, it's kind of a mess in some ways, like mm-hmm. baseball can be a really conservative sport. I think baseball is dominated, especially um, by like a like Christian culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I don't know how those players feel in the clubhouse. Like, I don't know how black players feel in the clubhouse when there are fewer and fewer black players mm-hmm. every year, right? Like when, when we're not investing in a game that should look diverse and can look diverse and actually is like historically rooted in American cities, but doesn't, quite look like that because we make it inaccessible to folks. So I, I don't know. This is a really big question. I don't know that I've answered it correctly, uh, but I feel like it's very Jewish to just continue to ask more questions <laughs> instead of giving an answer. That's what I'm going to say. I started this podcast during, um, during the pandemic when everybody was just at home and I was speaking to a lot of broadcasters and was the, you know, when the NBA was writing basically political slogans on jerseys and on courts and Dan Shulman, one of ESPN's greatest, he was like, I'm just here to broadcast a game for those two hours. People don't want to hear what I think. But I said at the same time, he actually broadcasted Sunday Night Baseball when Osama bin Laden was um, was killed. And he was explaining that in one year they're saying, you know, fly out to second base and he blah, blah, blah. And the other year they're saying, tell them that this is happening. And so many of America's large events, whether it's a Tree of Life shooting or 9-11, were actually surround or um, connected to the sports world. Right, the first game back after 9-11 with Mike Piazza hitting the home run. So is there not a connection between those two, but how can how does sports bring back a country, bring back people together? 
in this divisive world? Uh, I don't know that I'm going to have an answer to this question that you're going to like. I mean, when you were talking about like sports and 9-11, I also thought about like the ways, and this was part of a report that John McCain put together, Senator John McCain had put together mm -hmm. before he died, the ways in which the Department of Defense was using dollars to basically create like military propaganda that they used in sporting events. Uh, like all of those things that you saw, whether it was like reunions or big like flyovers or flags, like right. those those weren't those didn't happen organically. Like they were advertisements for the military. And so it's really challenging to sort of think about this question of like, how do sports fit into bringing America together? Because one, I think that our challenges right now are pretty deep and okay. probably like can't be solved by a baseball game. Uh, but two, I do think that there's always been political recognition that sports can be a vehicle through which people can make statements. And there are some individuals who have risked so much to be able to, like, use that platform to make a case or to demonstrate a cause. I mean, you know, you think about Muhammad Ali, you think about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, more recently, you think about Colin Kaepernick. I think people understand that there is space. I mean, I want to talk about Sue Bird and all of the women's basketball players and the fact that like WNBA players are people are pushing more strongly for Brittany Griner to come home than maybe like yes. officials in our U S government. Right. So there are people who recognize that there is a power and a platform in sports and that it can shape national conversation because of the way that people invest time in it. But I think that also there are like entities, whether they're corporations or governments who also understand that and can use it in ways to shape conversation that isn't as organic. Um, and I, you know, I just, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that sports can bring great joy to people and that people should be able to appreciate that joy. But I also am a person, and maybe this comes from my Judaism, that believes that with a platform, there is power and there mm -hmm. is obligation mm -hmm. and there's right and there's wrong and speaking out against wrong and advocating for what is right particularly if you enjoy any amount of privilege is really significant. Like I'm just a girl with like a few thousand Twitter followers. And yet like the extent to which I understand that I still have a little bit of privilege, like relative to the average person has always made me feel like it's incredibly important to speak out on things that I think that are morally or politically unjust. And so I get being like, you know, sports are a way that people sort of, turn off the news or disassociate or like try to find sort of a peaceful bubble within that. Um, and I don't want to discount that as like mm -hmm. a, a form of like recreation or even escapism, but people shouldn't die in this country for going to synagogue. People shouldn't die in this country for going to movie theaters. People mm -hmm. shouldn't die in this country for going to elementary school, right? Like we've, built a country in which we've asked death to be an occupational hazard for our public school teachers. And we also don't even pay them enough to live in their own communities. So there are things that are right and that are wrong and they shouldn't be characterized as political. And in those moments, we should be able to speak to them. And who gets to be the arbiter of what is okay to speak about and what isn't is actually formed from like a very serious and layered bias in the mm -hmm. media. And this comes from like my other hat of being a political yes. journalism, yes. right? Yes. Of those conversations for very, very long being dictated um, by white men of privilege. Um, and also like all of the corporate in interests that play into like what a corporate media is and how they're incentivized to tell stories. And I feel like we should all have a civic obligation to make this country live up to its promise. And if, if athletes or sports personalities can play a role in that, they should. I mean, a, a really tangible example of this is um, Ben Strauss, who's the media reporter at the Washington Post, a really, really great one, just had this piece recently about the marriage between The Athletic and The New York Times. So The Athletic is that big sort of yeah. sports media conglomerate for your listeners who might not follow. I'm sure they all do if they're watching this podcast. Uh, and they were recently acquired by the New York Times. 
And the New York Times basically told athletic reporters that they weren't going to be able to speak on anything related to politics or current events, because that would be a violation of New York Times standards. And it didn't sit well with some of those sports reporters who mm. wanted to be able to say that, like, AR-15s are wrong or racism is wrong. And there are so many questions we could ask about why those were the rules and who wants to say things and who doesn't. Uh, but I think it's just a reflection of how challenging this can be for people to understand or to decide whether they want to use their platform to talk about these issues. You know, so I think it's not an and or. I think it's actually and, meaning, yeah. right? Obviously, it's an escape. We love to just sit down and watch the game. But when you, I mean, that's the job of you as a sports mm -hmm. reporter, it's the job of me. There's a reason why I give a sermon on Yom Kippur about Ernie Johnson, because watching the game, I got spiritual material to share with our community of the difference between right and wrong as well. Just a couple of weeks ago, we we're honored. We hosted Ennis Cantor Freedom here at Sinai Temple, and he said, can you bring Jewish, Christian, and Muslim kids together? That would not have happened if I didn't love the game. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing the game, understanding what's happening there, and then bringing that into your community to make a little difference, just a little difference every day, I think is a really, really important point. The last clip I want to share with you and last question is actually Rabbi Wolpe's Rosh Hashanah sermon, which okay. I shared the first one, which was about, you know, should a rabbi be talking about this stuff? And the answer okay. was basically yes. This was a fascinating little uh, teaching from the Talmud about the Colosseum in the role of Rome. And should we be watching the games? And when I say games, we mean basically sports. Okay. Because then Rabbi Natan comes along and he says, not only are you allowed to go, you should go. Because if you go, then you can scream at the end, thumbs up, and maybe we will save a life. Can you imagine? Go to the worst place where they do the worst things because you still might be able to save someone because it's not a game. It's not about how many likes you have. It's about your soul. That was amazing. On Rosh Hashanah, he actually took this thing from the Talmud that said, should we go to the Roman Colosseum where it was different than the arena that we have today, that it was actually people like killing each other. And the rabbis say, no, 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 you can't go there. And the other rabbis say, no, you go because you can make a difference. So the last question is, religion and sports, can they make a difference in this country together? That's a really big question. And I don't have as deep of a well of anecdotes from the Talmud or from the Torah, but something that's on my mind a lot because it's one of the only things that I get to watch other than sports is Sesame Street uh, with my two-year-old. And um, the first thing that I thought about when you asked this question, and maybe this is just sleep deprivation, but the first thing I thought about was there is an Elmo the Musical about him imagining himself as an athlete mm. and uh it's he's the little athlete and there's a big athlete and there's a pair of golden shoes and he really wants the golden shoes i mean that feels a little biblical right uh and they're the last competition if he wins it he can get the shoes and the big athlete trips and there's a moment they show elmo and he's like oh golden shoes help big athlete oh golden shoes help big athlete and he decides to help the big athlete. And the moral of the story is basically that, you know, it's not whether you win the lose or win or lose, it's how you play the game, mm -hmm. but made really simple so a preschooler can understand it. And, you know, when you think about what faith and sports can be, I don't think that you need religion to have a moral architecture of your life. I think that you can build a moral and just life without it. But I do think that there are a lot of people in this country who are buttressed by having a religious faith and by having relationships with faith leaders like you um, who are willing to reach them sort of in the language that makes sense to them. You know, this is part of that first clip that you showed right. was, yeah, it's important to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, the Torah is a very old document and you have to make it meaningful for people. And so connecting lessons and life to something that feels like people can touch it like sports people can touch it's mm -hmm. easy to write about sports it's easy to find sports metaphors and it's easy to show how right 
and wrong and being good in sports, like good as a person, can be separate from wins and losses. Mm -hmm. And I think that that just that simple concept can be really powerful and important. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to be optimistic in answering your question. We're a people of hope. (laughs) I, I mean, sometimes. Not as much as I would like to admit to be. Um, I think people really need to find connection in days like today. And they need to find community. And maybe that comes in a faith community. Maybe that comes in a sports community. Maybe it's this weird marriage of both. Like, I have an entire episode about how the Mets are the most Jewish team. And like that, I mean it in a completely metaphysical way. Mm-hmm. And it's a very funny episode. I, I hope that uh, some of your watchers will like it. It'll happen. It'll be um, live in two weeks. But I don't know. I feel like um, for people who believe in justice and righteousness, however their vehicle gets them there, mm-hmm. I think it's it'll be helpful for all of us to reach an America that we we can live in and that I hope we leave for my son and should we, he choose to have children one day, like his kids, like it's hard to think about what this world will look like that far in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, And part of that difficulty is, is really like challenging, right? So I would like to believe that there are tools and conversations that will help bring us to a place of inclusion um, and of, you know, like, a majority of Americans who get to live in the multiracial democracy that we deserve, where people are free to go to synagogue or not go to synagogue and live to tell the tale of it. Um, It's really like, you've asked a lot of really deep questions. And I feel like if I were a rabbi, I I would have been better situated to answer them. Um, But I hope that, I hope I've done an okay job of it. Absolutely. Your anecdotes on the ground of seeing inside of what we all watch from the screen or watch from the stands is exactly what we're looking for here on Rabbi on the Sidelines. Meredith Shiner, the host of the new podcast, The Franchise, Jew Sports in America, just started yesterday. We hope you uh, continue to follow Meredith. Nationally recognized journalist, communications expert, basically appeared on every news channel. We're not going to go through the whole list, but it's amazing. Your career is amazing. And we look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you for joining the Rabbi on the Sidelines, Meredith. Have a great week. Thank you. Week.